My name is Howard Blumenthal, and this is the third episode of Reinventing School. We're really excited to be here. We have guests from Alaska and Amsterdam, and also Boston, and also Wisconsin uh, this time. And the subject is distance learning, but that may be, we may take an approach that it might be a bit different from what you've been hearing before. Uh, and the reason for that is, well, there are about pushing 2 billion students around the world. And at on a very good day, half of them have access to any form of digital communication, um, whether it's electricity or it's connectivity or it's devices or any number of other things. So part of what we're going to talk about is how do we think about this as a long-term solution if half of students worldwide can't use it? The other question is, how well does it really work? And do we have alternatives? Uh, because there are rumors afoot that this will not be the very last time we see this virus or shutdowns or economic disasters or any of the other fun and games that we've all been dealing with. So with that, um, we are ourselves also dealing with the, the, the fun of trying to connect everybody worldwide through Zoom and making sure everybody gets the right messages and all that. So with us uh, right now, we have Jessica Petrowski. Uh, Jess, you're in, in Amsterdam, right? That's so correct. can you kind of run through very briefly what you do in Amsterdam? Sure. I'm the director of the Center for Research on Children, Adolescents, and the Media here at the university. So I'm really thinking about how young children access, use, experience media, media on a daily basis. And um, well, as you can imagine, the questions I have now are changing dramatically with the way the world is changing around us. Very good. And we also, from very far away, a whole bunch of time zones, six and four, maybe 10 time zones away, something like that. Uh, we have Monica Goyette, right? And uh, you are outside Anchorage. You're about 30, 40 miles outside Anchorage, Alaska. So, of course, everybody's image of Anchorage, Alaska is going to be much colder than, than what you are probably experiencing now. So can you give us a sense of place and also what you do there, right? Yes. Uh, so I've worked in our school district for 21 years. I've been the superintendent for the last three years. Uh, we have 25,000 miles in our school district. It's roughly our district is the size of West Virginia. And we have 47 schools with 19,000 students ranging from remote K-12 schools with 30 kids to comprehensive, comprehensive traditional high schools of 1,000 kids. And is it very rural? Is it just a suburb of Anchorage? Give us a sense of place. So it's a mixture of both. There are areas that uh, are really kind of a subdivision for commuters into Anchorage. Uh, and as you move farther uh, north, uh, it becomes very remote. Uh, and so we're a very conservative district where uh, Alaska is known as a conservative state, but Matsu is probably one of the most conservative areas. And over time, our district has really embraced a philosophy of parent choice. Uh, we have six charter schools. Uh, we have a middle college. Uh, we have very robust homeschool programs. And uh, we are very proud of that. And uh, students in our school can go to any school that they want to in the district. And in fact, many of our students go to multiple schools. Interesting. So we'll, talk, we'll talk about that. But just curious, distance learning. Is this something that I, I would imagine is easier for people who are in busier locations. It's more difficult, I would think, in, in rural locations. I think I said that correctly. Um, what's connectivity like? And how about the reliability of that? And also devices and, and income levels and all of that. You have to deal with that whole mix, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so connectivity is not a significant issue. About 10% of our families report that they have difficulty with it. Uh, but we, uh, early on, uh, and really what I want to focus on today is what the work we've done over a decade that I think helped us pivot quickly. But uh, early on, we embraced technology as an opportunity to uh, kind of close the digital divide for our students in uh, schools of poverty and our remote schools that might have a very small faculty and can't offer a lot of electives uh, for students. So we have been working on online platforms for a while. And uh, one of the things of, as we've done our iterations of choice with families moving from choosing a school to choosing multiple programs and courses at different schools is uh, we kind of had a merging of between those practices that were happening at our school and moving more into a blended format where we could adapt uh, through software uh, to our students' needs. And our homeschool programs that were really good at online platforms 
wanting things in brick and mortar schools and on any our students that are in homeschool access activities and courses in our schools all across the district. Uh, so I really think that blended model helped us pivot very quickly for this. Very good. That's a, so I, I also want to introduce, just joined us, David Weinberger. David, if you can hear us, can you? I can hear you. Can you hear me be ashamed and apologetic? No, I think we're fine. Uh, and your timing is perfect, because I was just going to say, and David, and then there you are. Um, so David, your background is very varied, and I know you've been working a lot in machine learning and artificial intelligence in that world. So as we're beginning to discuss what does it mean to think about distance learning in Alaska, which is what, what Monica was talking about, um, the view I'd like to get from you is, is distance learning just sort of a stop along the way because it's convenient? Or do we need to be thinking about this as a longer term way of the world? Any thoughts? Um, sure, thoughts. Are they uh, well grounded in anything? No, but it's hard to imagine. So it's a convenience for people who have the option of going to real world schools. Um, th that's when I think it looks like a convenience. If you don't have that option for all of the different sorts of reasons, that exists in the world, then it's, it's, I don't know that it presents itself as a convenience, but it is an opportunity that's not replaceable by the option for either, you know, for all the reasons, because you're working, because you're poor, because you're isolated, et cetera, so you can't take off the, you know, um, I guess I'm thinking about actually um, uh, college and above, but likewise, you know, before all of, all of the, um, all of the world, I mean, uh, um, I, it, I think it depends a lot on how people's experiences are using this. Because um, uh, if, if everybody use, uh, uses it now because it's the only thing we have and it's really, really crummy and people hate it, then that's one thing. If people are discovering that it's different, we are suffering, I think, frequently from just sort of naturally treating as if it's treating it as, as simply a replacement for uh, real world um, uh, classes and education. Um, but if we start discovering ways in which it's not simply a replacement, it's a different thing and start getting used to the advantages and disadvantages that it brings, then it's hard to see why we would give up on it. Um, certainly a lot of academic institutions um, will are already finding this way more cost effective. Not necessarily the best reason. It's not the best pedagogic reason, but it's a pretty strong incentive. In and it, co it comes into the conversation. I want to introduce Aiden. Aiden is in uh, Milwaukee, if I have that right, in Wisconsin, in the United States. And uh, you're our customer for this, right? You're the one who's, we're all talking about what we're going to do and the best ways to do it. You're living this every day. And you're really relying upon adults to organize this so that you end up with a proper education, whatever that means in this century. How's it going? Um, it's good. Uh, it's very different and it's almost, I find it harder to learn um, in this distance learning because my school does it a bit differently than many others. Uh, my school is a Waldorf school and it has a more I guess, analog philosophy when it comes to learning. It, there's not, like, they don't teach with computers. It's much more hands-on, which is very, you know, hard to do now since, you know, all, uh, we're all isolated and, you know, we're not really going to school anymore. So what they do is that they send, is that my parents go to the school at a specific time every few weeks to pick up a packet full of learning material and and uh and it varies on the grades but it i find it harder to learn at home than at school now why i i find like the information is much more harder to retain than when i was at school it's a lot less engaging um and uh, and i can't really ask as many questions as i could since like we don't do many Zoom calls with the teachers. It's much more um, just reading out of like a textbook style uh, format, and then and then we can, and then and for me, like you can always email the teacher whenever you want. But it, 
I only really email my teacher if I have, uh, you know, big problems. So it's, it, it's harder for me. So you're on your own to a greater extent is what I'm getting. Jessica, you have a, a wonderful worldview of this because you, you speak to people who are involved with both media and education and kids all over the world. Yeah. Can you make some, can you connect some dots for us here? Is Aiden's experience unusual? Is it fairly typical of certain kinds of schools or certain kinds of students? Does everybody just have to learn on their own? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, actually, what we're finding is um, it also depends where we're at in the grade level we're talking about, too. So we're seeing differences where we are in the grade level, certainly by district, certainly by economic uh, attributes of the district, also whether or not the school is already connected in some way. So, for example, even here in the Netherlands, I see a very big difference. You could live just a few miles apart. And if your school was a school, for example, that was already using Google Chromebooks, there's a system sort of in place and the teachers have an easier step to sort of build into this an online home environment. But then there's other schools that are actually doing the sending home packets of information. Um, and in many cases, um, for example, here in the Netherlands and elsewhere, we've seen there's so much reliance on parents right now. And that's not the teacher's fault either, to be fair. I mean, many of these teachers are doing the very best they can, but they also have not yet been upskilled in how to do this. And so there's a, there's a sense here sometimes, oh, of, well, the teacher should be doing more. And I'm also speaking to teachers who say, I'm not even sure what to do. I plan a lesson plan. And so I'm sending my lesson plans home to the parents because I'm not, there's no rule book yet on how to do this. I haven't been shown it yet. But then there's other schools who really have already been practicing some attributes of distance learning, in which case this next step is far easier for them. And they have sort of a, a structure in place and more training in place and more support for teachers in place. And that really changes what the distance learning looks like. Thank you. Monica, you've got every flavor of this in your, because you have so many different kinds of schools and so many different kinds of students. Can you give us a sense of how you manage this and what it's like to work for a school district that also has to fairly strictly manage a budget through all of this, right? So this isn't just do whatever we want. This is do the best we can under a number of different circumstances. The crashed economy, I'm assuming the same is true in Alaska, uh, and also employment issues, and also parents who never signed up we, we outsourced a lot of this, right? Now all right. of a sudden everything is, uh, you know, is in the hands of the individual household. So how do you even begin to think about this? How do you work with your staff? And most importantly, how do you plan for what November is going to look like? Well, that's a lot of questions. Um, so, uh, well, first, uh, there's areas that I think that we uh, launched and did fairly well in. Uh, and those are with our core academic classes, uh, such as mathematics, language, uh, uh, the Zoom platforms, we can have kids call in, we deployed a lot of devices. Areas that we really struggle in are those areas that, uh, kind of what Aiden's speaking to, a different uh, way of teaching, our career and technical education classes. Of course, if it's a drafting class, that's pretty easy to move to an online platform, but if it's a construction trades course or uh, or vet tech, those are more challenging things. Uh, and uh, therapy within special education. We had already done teletherapy for speech therapy, but uh, physical therapy and occupational therapy are challenges. So there's different layers and then there's different capacity within the staff. So uh, really we had laid uh, tremendous groundwork uh, for online tools. So we, we had some advantages there. I think one of the challenges moving forward and what we really... Uh, are going to have to think about is always using CDC guidelines, but those those three scenarios of low risk, moderate risk, high risk, low risk, we're back on site uh, with mitigation strategies, uh, moderate risk, we're doing kind of a blended where maybe a cohort half days or every other day, and then remote learning. But it's not just that a school is going to be moving back and forth because it's not going to be linear. We'll be going back and forth between those. But parents within those schools are going to want different options. So now a brick and mortar school also has to be able to deliver a blended model and a remote delivery because of all those students from brick and mortar schools that they migrate into our just traditional homeschool programs with half the revenue and that would have an economic impact. Uh, so this is very complex. 
uh, and uh, very dynamic. And uh, but we had a week to launch it the first time, and now we have summer. So that's the bright side. <laughs> And, and I mean, congratulations for doing the job that you're doing. And that certainly goes out to everybody on the student, parent, school district. Everybody is just doing the very best they can under the circumstances. But the circumstances are in flux and not for the obvious reasons. While we're all thinking about how are we going to do social distancing in November and can we open swimming pools and beaches and all that, um, David has been sniffing around another area for a while. Um, the fundamentals of how we learn, how we interact with technology is in the midst of very rapid change. So can you apply some layers of what this could look like, David? Um, because it could be a very, very exciting future and quite different from what we're talking about now. So explain the entire future of education to us, okay? Yeah, no, no, the boomer first has to unmute before he can lay out the vision of all education. I have no <laughs> idea what will happen. Um, the optimistic, because uh, we, we've already seen over the past 25 years that as uh, the, the tools of, of knowledge, which have been books and print, literacy basically, have come unglued from, from pages and paper that the nature of knowledge itself has changed. We're, we're not all the way through this change, there's, but and there's a lot of uh, understandable agita about it. Um, it has clearly disrupted the institutions and the uh, nature uh, of knowledge and the, uh, the authorities, the nature of authority and knowledge. I mean, all sorts of stuff that teachers and librarians and parents and citizens work through and it's good and bad. Um, the, the, and I think we're likely, I, I, I don't know what's going to happen, but it seems likely that what we're now living through this online education that's been suddenly dropped on us with a, <laughs> a week's preparation, um, that this, this is a searing event and we are going to react to it. And so just by looking at the, our reaction to the um, lifting of knowledge off of pages, um, it, one could guess that we will um, uh, experience it as a diminishment, at least at first. And it's hard to deny that the, these, you know, the Hollywood squares, the boxes on the screen are, are um, a diminishment of being together in person. And yet there are, um, eventually we start to discover the advantages of it, just as we have with the digitizing of, of text and graphics and video and the rest of it, and the connection of them, which is a really important point. So one of the things that we see in this sort of environment, it's not novel in the world at this point by any means, but there's the chat and um, there's some activity in the chat and supplementing it. Uh, it's easy to imagine many classrooms where that would be the distraction will be turned off, but we're getting used to the idea of having in this environment, having a chat. Um, the environment I hope will change because right now it is very much, I'm talking and you can't. I mean, literally, I am talking and you can't. I have the box and that's not how we work in classrooms. It's not how we work around, uh, talk around the dinner table. It's far more layered and um, more sort of social subtleties in how we decide who gets to hold the floor and the like. Nevertheless, if this is like what's happened to knowledge, then um, we're going to be arguing for uh, a couple decades about whether this is purely a diminishment or whether we also will, and at the same time, I think we'll be um, embracing the ways in which it changes and enhances the process. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a break in a second, uh, talk about, so you'll get a sense of some of the upcoming, we do this every week, so you get a sense of what some of the upcoming episodes look like. Um, and then when we come back, I, I, I really want to pull together, if it's not distance learning 2020, but we're in 2030 and machine learning has become very commonplace so that Aiden is not getting packets, Aiden is on his completely individualized learning path that is made possible by technology we're inventing today. So we'll get into that right after this.
for on-demand episodes and more, visit our website. I love the idea that we're going to be covering everything from curiosity to play in the middle of this conversation. Um, one of the things that has struck me as very bizarre through this process is the number of kids who've said, you can do whatever you want with technology. I still want to have a teacher nearby. The teacher still, no matter what form we take, the teacher seems to be that one important connection. And the thing that's amazing about school when you sit and do the calculations is that of all the institutions around the world, school is one of the only things that exists in almost every town and every village everywhere. And soon, I think, Chromebook will be the most commonly used word in the language of the entire world. It just seems to me that everybody has the same Chromebook rack everywhere, every school I visit. It's the craziest thing. So what I want to do, Aiden, if technology was available to you in a much more abundant way, and I'm not talking about an iPad, I'm talking about serious artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, the ability for systems to understand where you're going, what you do, how you breathe, all of those things. And you were able to have a customized learning program for yourself. What would you want? Um, not sure. I guess if... So, if it was a... So, you're talking about a machine... Uh, sort of catered to what I'm want to learn. So I'm almost I, talking about when a woman wears perfume, she sprays mm -hmm. it into the air and then walks through it. Right now, imagine all of those little droplets, not as a virus, but as knowledge, right? As the world of knowledge that you could just encase yourself in and carry with you almost as if it was in the air. How do you, what do you want to know? Who do you want to be? Just an easy question. Oh, well, um, well, I play piano, um, and that's kind of my passion at the moment. Uh, like, I, and I'm very interested in music theory, which is m the more academic side of music. So if I, so if I wanted uh, something like that, I, it'd probably have to do with music. And that's what, that's what I would want, and so. Would you exclude other subjects in order to spend more time with music? Um, potentially, yeah. Um, it depends. Uh, like, uh, if I could, uh, um, maybe a foreign language I might exclude. I don't know. Um, uh, it's because like, they're, I don't know. In, in college, like, I, I'd like to study music. So, I don't know, I might exclude other subjects to uh, study music. So, hey, yes, Monica? I would. Monica, are you going to let him do it? Heck yeah. <laughs> now, how does that work? And I'm going to now begin asking a similar question of Jessica and David. There's curriculum, there's state rules, there's tests, there's all those oh, things. You mean how in, are we going to do this? How are we going to have Adam and Aiden do this? Yeah, well, certainly that's there are standards that you have to meet. I think uh, one of the things that technology is going to help us do is really focus on a competency based or mastery based where kids can accelerate faster through grade level material uh, and really provide more opportunities for them to go deeper in uh, to areas of passion like Aiden has. Okay, uh, Jessica, how does this fit into the worldview that you're part of and seeing and developing? Yeah, well, I think actually, so in addition to running the research center that I do, I'm also uh, related to this point. Um, I'm one of the people leading the charge with taking the University of Amsterdam digital right now. So I'm also thinking of this from educating uh, bachelor students, master students, doctoral students. So I'm also thinking of it in higher education. And um, so I think your question is great, but I would probably pull it back for a second and say where I'm facing right now is this difference between emergency crisis teaching and distance learning. And right now, part of our questions and our thoughts and our thinking is because we're seeing so many challenges in the moment, inherent to a variety of things. Um, skills of teachers who need more support and infrastructure, uh, access points for students, um, knowing how to translate this material. So right now we're seeing 
um, I mentioned to you before we were before this began. I've seen teachers in a very well-meaning way say, "Okay, I would normally give a two-hour lecture. I will now do it on Zoom," which of course does not work. But it takes us doing that to see that it doesn't work. Because in our head, it seems like, well, that should be okay. And what we actually need to begin, I think, thinking about is going back to the core ideas. What is our content that we want to teach? What is our goals? What was our pedagogical values for a particular lecture, class, whatever that is? Now, let's say this is how I did it offline. Great. In the online experience, how do I achieve these goals? What does it look like to achieve them in this online space? And actually what we see sometimes is exactly to Monica's point, we can achieve them potentially even in a slightly richer way with eventually more personalized learning because every student will have their own more unique learning path eventually. But in the immediacy, we just take what we do offline and figure out how we can throw it digital. But with some time and thought, we can actually begin to think about how we can do it even, how we can be uh, capitalizing on the affordances of digital technology to rethink the the aims we have and how we can do it even better. But that's a process. And once we get there, I think we can do things like supporting Aiden in really unique ways. So, David, when I was in uh, an English major, uh, undergraduate, uh, I would sit in a room filled with 30 people who knew nothing about Chaucer and they would read Chaucer aloud. It was crushing. For me, that was the college experience and so much of the high school experience too. I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to do it at all. I had no reason to spend my time doing it. What I wanted to do was some known and some unknown. What I wanted to do was have somebody help me map what I was interested in, and bookstores helped me to do that. Libraries helped me to do that. But now we have much better technology, and we still have bookstores and libraries. So how do we create sort of an individualized map so that Aiden can see a path? He can just choose to pursue those paths or not. But that connectedness of the internet, the original hyperlinked world that Apple had been playing with before they started making dumb boxes, um, how do we get there? And should we? Uh, so uh, first of all, Aiden, I'm actually really, I find it very encouraging and enheartening that you don't quite know what you want to do. I think it's a hundred percent appropriate and it's, it's how learners learn, right? It's, it's uh, fantastic. Um, I don't know what to do. I, I just don't have a opinion worth listening to about what we do about trying to establish a, a core curriculum um, and all of the arguments for and against, and especially, I mean, the testing side of it, of course, bothers me. The standardized testing bothers me as, as a parent uh, a great deal as well as a, as a citizen. But I, I don't know. It, it's, it's a really difficult problem. Um, I will say that uh, we know what's going to happen to, and what actually we want to have happen to the students who graduate from our classes at any, any level. And we know that they're already doing it, which is we want them out in the world collaboratively learning, teaching um, at the same time, talking, arguing, uh, presenting ideas that um, are worthwhile or are not, and to be engaged in a network. We sometimes say community. I think network is a more accurate because uh, networks are more open and intermittent and, uh, and scarier and, um, and in some ways uh, and broader as well. Um, we want them to be engaged in a network that will, uh, will push back. On, on their ideas and we hope in a res respectful way and, and without, you know, the way that we want people to talk, you, you don't need to hear this from me. Um, that's how they're gonna learn for the rest of their lives. That's how we learn, it's how everybody, I think on this call, that's what we do. We have a question, we go out on the internet, we everybody thinks they're getting good answers and I think most of the people on this call know enough to actually they're getting good answers. They're engaged in really interesting conversations. They're getting, they're learning about stuff they never would have thought of before. Um, this, is a, this is the greatest time in human history to be a seeker of knowledge. It's also the greatest time in human history to be a complete idiot because we see plenty of that. And one of the things that since that, since we already know our students are already out in the world and that's how they're going to be lifelong learners and they will be because it's too interesting. The world is, turns out to be just too, too interesting. We also, I think, in every classroom, and this is, I think, one of the possible advantages of doing this online, is we need to make it clear that these are not two, two separate worlds. There's the physical world um, with its books and its libraries, and I, 
I've worked in libraries for years. I, you know, I don't mean to take anything away from them. I love them. Uh, but with its physical books and, and, and tools of learning. And then there's this online world, which is very different. It is very different, but there's only one world. We only live in one world. And the access to the online world is, is integrated into uh, the real world, into our real selves. And so it seems to me that, um, and I think this is obvious, that education from the very, very beginning should assume that knowledge, the discussions, the conversation, the learning, all of that stuff goes on right now and will forever online. That's where, that's where it is. Well, and if we're not preparing our students to dealing with that in ways in which they, they learn rather than, you know, uh, I want to read wrong. a comment. I want to read a comment. This is from one of the, the people who are watching now. I've taught for 40 years, the first 20 without testing and the second with. I feel my students were much better educated in my first 20 years, and I was a better and more creative teacher. I work harder now, but with less positive results. Now, the obvious, you know, there's a lot of obvious discussions that everybody who is part of this is well aware of. My question, I guess, to Monica is, what does it look like 10 years from now? Because David is laying out a vision that is highly digital, and I suspect that Jessica would have some similar direction. Um, and I wonder, with all of this technology and all of our understanding of how learning works, and we're certainly building a lot of knowledge on that very quickly, um, where do we go? How do we make sure that we're not in this trap? It's pretty clear that evaluation is not that important in this era. So maybe it's not that important at all. As in evaluation as assessment of learning, is that what you're referring to? I'm not sure what evaluation is anymore, to be honest. I mean, if I'm watching a movie about, if I'm watching Gandhi to learn about India, do you want me to vote for who best supporting actor is? I'm not sure what I'm evaluating. I, I watched the movie. I'm good. I, I I tried to read the Chaucer. It didn't work out so well. But did you really want to test me after that? I could have told you. I didn't understand him. Leave me alone. I want to read something else. Go ahead. Well, I think, I mean, what I'm seeing in our district is uh, with, with options, there's a lot more agency for students that, and families that they can choose what they want. So uh, they may choose an AP teacher at one school and uh, a, a different teacher at another school. Uh, I do think that uh, software will allow us. We, you know, high schools, this, the traditional high school is built around the Carnegie unit, which is really just seat time. Like you come and you have to sit in this class for an hour, five days a week for this long, and that's how you earn credit. And I think that this is going to help us move beyond that and where students are demonstrating uh, competency in a variety of different ways to assess that uh, and then freeing up areas that they want to move into. Uh, I think asynchronous learning is really going to help us with that, where kids can choose uh, their pace, uh, path, and place for learning, where they're going to do that, uh, how fast they're going to do that, uh, what they're going to learn, and what time of day they want to learn it. Jessica, what do you see as you're traveling the world? Are you seeing what Monica is describing? And I, I suspect what David is hoping we're, we're seeing and hopefully um, what we can do for Aiden here. Is it real or is it just sort of, yeah, right now we're saying that because we're in a crisis? I think it's where we hope, but I'm not seeing it as equally everywhere. I'm seeing actually massive gaps in what I might call digital competence that I think are probably a, um, I don't want to call it a soft skill per se, but it's a skill that I think we are not um, unilaterally teaching to our students right now. And I think that this plays a massive, has a massive effect on even capitalizing on this content. And when I talk about digital competence, and I've been writing and working across Europe thinking about this, it's very interesting because often the first thing that comes to people's mind is, did you teach kids how to be safe online? And I understand the value of safety and I don't negate think helping young people and all of us, frankly, knowing how to navigate the digital world in a safe way that respects our own ideas of privacy. I think that's important. But what I see missing is also in many spaces around the world, teaching young kids how to think critically about the content they are seeing so they can judge its authenticity or not, or at least be able to think about it. Uh, thinking about the values of collaboration. We're talking about the value of socialization and more than ever, 
this is probably something we're really thinking about because the education space is also for socialization. And when we're physically distancing, how do we achieve that in a digital space? That means knowing how to collaborate with one another and in, 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 in a way that's uh, safe for young people and knowing how to do that is not something we are born doing right now knowing how to create in this space and also knowing how to ask for help when you don't know what to do and where to go and what that means and how to get that access. These are things that these digital skills or digital competence as it's often called are really quite varied right now. And that in fact has a massive then trickle down effect in their ability to capitalize on the content that's provided to them and really seek its opportunities. And when they really have um, decrease digital confidence, what we see are all these risks that we worry about really emerge. And right now, actually, the individuals that we see who most often have really low digital confidence skills often have many other risk factors that would put them really at, um, for example, actually concerning rates with even uh, experiencing the pandemic right now. They're the most at risk groups even for the pandemic, let alone beyond. So in my view, what I'm seeing is a real need for thorough digital education for young people as part of their curriculum so that they can capitalize on that space. Aiden? Again, I'm going to sort of ask the how's it going question. So well, um, as you're dealing with friends who are going through this, everybody has different levels of resources and maturity and emotional stability and all that. How, did the, how does the puzzle look from your perspective? Well, what do you mean? Do you mean how, what, what do you mean? Do you feel yeah. that when students are trying to deal with the social emotional issues, but there isn't mm -hmm. an, an adult or a teacher or even friends nearby, there's nobody to give you a hug who's not, who you're not living with. Do you feel that's a real important part of this or do you just kind of, yeah, I'll just call somebody, I'll FaceTime, I'll whatever. Um, or do you feel as though there's a gap and do you think there's a does Zoom give you a digital equivalent to that? Or is there a whole other territory we're not touching? Well, uh, it's much more, uh, well, I don't know how to describe it. Well, one, one thing is for Zoom, there's body language. It's kind of hard to get a good read on somebody, how they're feeling. It's hard to comfort people on Zoom. Um, I don't really like Zoom. Okay, so my family has uh, every so often Zoom meetings, and they're always very awkward. Um, it's uh, it's very strange. Like it's it's hard to. I don't like it. I don't like the online. I don't. I don't really like uh, online. Uh, I don't know. Like I don't. I don't know how to describe it. I'm not a fan of the online learning, especially through Zoom. I, I'm, much, I'm much more of a hands-on person, and it's, I don't like it. I don't know. That's, David, we're dealing here with a digital native who's saying, leave me alone with this stuff. Help. We are dealing with a Waldorf student uh, <laughs> who is in one of the most immersive, engaged, environments and social environments um, imaginable uh, and designed designed for that. Um, so it, this must seem very uh, bereft of, of life and soul and, and actual people. Um, Zoom, is, Zoom is primitive. Um, we are at a primitive state of development and it may well be that um, I, it's, it is certainly the case because we know that people have different learning styles and they have different uh, personalities. Uh, some, I, some people like lectures, some people like small group, you know, um, some people are introverts. Uh, right now, this primitive technology that we are using assumes all sorts of things. Um, it, it, it's a leveler. Um, if you are not comfortable showing your face, uh, it's hard not to. You have to ask for an exception in, in many classes. I, I, I teach, uh, I've been teaching for four years at Harvard Extension School using Zoom. <laughs> it's an online course. And I know that there are students who just don't want to, their face to be seen. And of course, I, they can turn it off, but it's very obvious. I mean, you know, I'm, and that's an impediment. And there are people who don't like their backgrounds. Fortunately, you can now have a virtual background. There are people who, in some cases, don't like their foregrounds, and we don't have that yet. It is a one person speaks at a time. That cuts out most of the sociality. 
uh, which consists of people um, making decisions about when to sort of insert something or hold back or make the face that says, well, no, I want to, uh, all of the, that, those social cues, the richness of it, Zoom doesn't care about. It does some other things well, like, you know, the chats, and maybe someday we'll have a little running ticker on it that tells us how long the men are speaking and how long the women have spoken. And we can do uh, non-binary as well. Uh, but right now, it, it's it's basically Hollywood Squares. Sorry, Aiden, it's an old TV quiz show. It uh, could not be more static. It could not be more, well, it could be more linear, but it's got a long, long, long way to, to go. So, well, David, yeah, I don't know what to do about students. We hope for flexibility. So a student who's not responding to this environment, then you, try, you do what any teacher would do, I hope, which is try to make that student more comfortable and look for the affordances that will maybe offline that will, will help. You should know you are my center square on my screen. I'm just telling you. For, for, for <laughs> care. Uh, Jessica, we're going to come back to you in a minute. But first, we're going to take a quick break just to give everybody a minute to relax and take another look at what's coming up. on-demand episodes, and more, visit our website. So we're going to go to Jessica, and I'm hoping I can shape some of what you're saying a bit. As David was talking about what this, how primitive all of this is, I wonder what not primitive looks like. So let's go there, but you had something you wanted to say, so why don't we start with that? Yeah, I wanted to tap into this element of socialization because we're asking these questions right now. We're asking Aiden, for example, how do you feel right now in this experience? And I think one of the things we also need to be thinking about is let's start next year when the students haven't already had the opportunity to have a relationship with their teacher for so many months before this happened. This, I think, is something that we are forgetting or maybe not talking enough about right now. We have very interesting priority groups that are going to be, imagine a first year student at a new high school or a secondary school where it's their transitioning in. Often that very first month or two is such an incredibly powerful month, just not just in the knowledge they're gaining, but actually in their socialization experiences, getting to know new classmates, getting to know their teachers, getting to know sort of the, the normative culture of the space they're in. And this will affect whether you're going to a bachelor program or a secondary school or a high school, let alone just moving up your next grade to a new teacher. And right now, the teachers have had the, we're fortunate or not, depends how you look at this, that the teachers, many of them had a relationship with their students up to when this happened. So now when we've been pushed very suddenly to digital education, at least there was a connection already there. So it feels hard for many of us because it's pulled away, but we can sort of identify what's missing and think about this. And there was something there to start with. Next year comes around, it's an entirely different ballgame. And then how do we figure out how to do socialization? And that's, I think, a really important element of a successful education. Monica, how do you onboard people? How do you bring people in from one school to another when they can't see each other? How does the friendship thing work? Yeah, and I, Jessica just brings up such a great point. I think part of the reason why we were able uh, to even have the success we had is because there was a well-established relationship, not just with the teacher, but with classmates. And um, engagement is always a challenge when students are in the classroom and even more of a challenge in this situation. Uh, you know, we, I mean, we're trying to do, um, we, you know, we did virtual graduations. We're trying to do uh, virtual orientations as, as kids uh, transition in, uh, but it is going to be very challenging. And I think we'll have to set up structures. Uh, we have a lot of activities that are outside the core academic day that uh, really are about building those social emotional skills. Uh, and so I think as the next iteration, as we get better at this, uh, we will have to have opportunities for students that are built uh, around those social emotional learning opportunities. Which is high level language, but go a little more directly to it. The 
So how do I find my new best friend? How do I find my first girlfriend or my first boyfriend or have my first kiss if I can't have those informal experiences and spot somebody across a room? How do we do that? Because to me, if you're in ninth grade, that's way more important than the fact that we're studying Ivanhoe or whatever it is that, uh, hey, Aiden, what are you reading now? Give me a book that's a, that an eighth or ninth grader would read. I don't know. Uh, well, let's see. I don't know. I was reading uh, some Shakespeare when you were, in, I don't know. A uh, book I was reading? I was reading Shakespeare, actually. My, my, well, for history, you were reading. So Shakespeare... Yeah, the Globe Theater in in London is in trouble. They are going to the to the British legislature saying we may go out of business. So, do you save some teachers' jobs, or do you save the Globe Theater in Shakespeare? Anyone? You got a choice. You got to make a decision. Mm. Anybody chat that answer? I'm looking at the chat panel on the side. It's a really tough question, isn't it? Oh, somebody said Globe. All right, so we're just going to – all right. Somebody voted Globe. At, uh, it's actually Steve Blumenthal who is our music and uh, podcast producer. So um, that w- so it's the Globe. So three teachers just lost their job, but Shakespeare continues. Um, David, you were talking earlier about how Zoom is still fairly primitive. So if we could – and maybe we'll all start a new company now um, – invent something that did many of these things. What features would you want? What would you consider to be very important? So this isn't just distance learning. It's distance social. It's distant school. Do you feel that it's really important to have a sense of smell as part of the application? Do you feel that you have to be able to see people who are just roaming around their houses? Do you think it's important to know everybody's dog? Like, I'm not sure what direction you'd go, but how would you turn this into a profoundly more social experience? I'm not talking about adding a feature to Zoom. I'm saying, what would we invent? And and, uh, those of you out there, uh, Minecraft already exists as one. Uh, And by the way, uh, we had another comment that says, Shakespeare is largely irrelevant today. There are so many other ways for students to use their time. So we're going to have a bunch of opinions about that. Yeah, well, now you've gone too far, Mr. Hamlin. I know, I know. Sorry, I, I sort of like Shakespeare. Um, so I, I don't know. Um, I, the method that uh, is common for you know, software developers on, on the web uh, is, I think, is a good methodology here. In fact, I think it's the only one, which is rather than the Zoom company or any of the others deciding, oh, we know how it's going to work and let's build out a full featured thing. Um, you start with a Zoom-like thing. Um, certainly don't assume everybody, you know, Zoom is the only thing in around, but you start with a, a Zoom-like thing and then you systematically uh, ask and listen, ask people what they need. You listen to what they are saying, especially to one another. I'm not eavesdropping, but you know, out on, on the internet. And you start um, maybe having some uh, opt-in metrics so you can see what features people are using and you use that to build out what the product should be. Um, the product uh, clearly is going to have to serve lots of different ways of learning, lots of different sorts of personalities. If this is going to be a real thing, um, it has to be able to work at very low bandwidth uh, because there's lots of people who around the world and in the U.S. who just don't have bandwidth. Um, and it, it seems to me that it would be a mistake to think that uh, the solution is always going to be uh, in front of our cell, in front of our eyes on a screen, that this we also need to be thinking, and well, there's been obviously a lot of thinking about this, um, and some of they're quite relevant in the world of MOOCs um, about what sorts of overall strategies we want to employ. Is it, can we manage to have offline meetings now? At the time of coronavirus, it's a lot harder, but um, there are mixed hybrid models that are waiting to be discovered. Um, what other institutions do we want to involve? Libraries are a really obvious one to start bringing in as a place in which um, students at some point could gather and interact with one another and with a screen and so forth. Uh, okay. It is a time we are just at the beginning of this. Just at the beginning. Jessica, what are you seeing? What do you want? 
Yeah. So what we're seeing is that there's actually been um, right now, the conversations are breaking down the content into two levels, the socialization levels and the pedagogy levels and saying that actually let's try to separate these two things out and recognize them as both core elements of education. Certain things we can do in the digital space, classic pedagogy, we actually can do if we take the time to reflect on and if we provide the money, the resources and training, we can actually do this pretty well. The socialization element, maybe that's how we start using, particularly in times of a pandemic, the buildings we have. We bring small groups together for particular meetings. So instead of bringing an entire class together, you bring your small student teams in to work hands on for a set period of time on their project where they need that sort of robust interaction where the collaborative nature really cannot be replaced by digital technology. So you actually level it out and you rethink how you use the physical structures of your school system and actually break it down into part the parts that are the you can do online and the parts that the collaborative entity is so valuable. And you really just rethink the way we teach. And that requires a lot of time and energy. So Monica, you can do that. You said you have an area the size of West Virginia. Yeah. Are you going to redesign it? And by the way, you're going to redesign it in real space. You're going to use Minecraft to do it. Yeah. (laughs) So uh, we actually received a waiver from our commissioner of education two years ago uh, to develop a blended learning model in elementary school. And what we did is we offered two sessions in an AM and a PM session. And really the premise of it is very similar to what Jessica described At home, students used online uh, uh, software uh, platforms to learn kind of the rote basic skills that they need in language and mathematics. And then they would come to school for half a day and uh, they would do integrated curriculum, uh, oftentimes a focus uh, with STEM uh, background. And uh, it was fantastic. We were able to do multi-grade. And the other thing that we were able to build in through it, which many districts have a challenge financially now, is that this was an economic efficiency. Uh, We could have 20 students in a section. So a teacher had 40 kids total, but any given time, only 20 in the room. And uh, it was Monday through Thursday, and then Friday was their planning day. And so uh, it was an economic efficiency as well for us because our average classroom size can be 25. Uh, there were barriers, so everybody in education wants to maintain their status quo. So well, that's, that's, in that that's in that model, that's the challenge. So part of what we're dancing around, I think, is do you set this up in? Uh, there's sort of three lanes that I'm that I'm seeing emerge here. One is the individual. I want to learn this. I will find a way to do it on my own. If you can provide some support, that's great. On the other side, the other side of the road is. Um, I really need the structure of school and the status quo really serves me well. And in the middle is a, sort of a very odd blend that is so in some ways is pick what you want from each of the other two lanes, because my needs are different hour to hour, sometimes minute to minute. I'm really good at math. I'm now crying because I have no idea how to solve this problem. And it seems to me that it's really important. I never made that connection before. Um, So in studying the history of India, it never occurred to me that because the British had lost the United States, India became very important. Therefore, they were battling in all sorts of different ways with Russia and Germany to protect the area around Ukraine and what become the Soviet republics. I never connected those dots before. I was so excited reading The Silk Roads by Peter Frankopan, great book, um, when I learned something. It was like all of a sudden, all these light bulbs went off and I wanted to go into that middle lane. I wanted a better teacher to say, I just read this stuff, it's really interesting, tell me more. I had nobody to go to, right? So, and that happens all the time. That's learning, we're all still doing it. But we don't have a structure, but we do have all of this en- enormously exciting technology coming. A lot of it is here already. And yet we're struggling having not planned properly to use it. I'm scratching my head. Like wh- how, I mean, it seems to me that you've been very advanced, Monica, in your thinking, but many schools aren't. And certainly many classrooms aren't. I'm wandering around West Philadelphia, for example. I'm not seeing what I want to be seeing there. Um, you know, there's still old fashioned classrooms where it's difficult to hear the teacher if you're beyond the second row. We still have those problems. And during the year, you have different weather in the classroom and much of it is uncomfortable. So we're still overcoming those kinds of issues. And at the same time, what do you do 
to push all of this into the future and turn it into a tremendous advantage. Aiden, what do we do? What do you want? What's the most, what's the best thing we could give you? What's the gift? Um, I don't know. I'd like to have uh, as many resources as possible. I, and so no one really feels alienated because there are some schools which are made um, for specific subjects. So if, because, and, and every uh, kid is different. So if they want to study music like me, or if they want to study um, math, like I know a lot of kids who are super, you know, interested in math or science, history, whatever they, I'd, I'd like for them to all have those, those resources. So if it was moved online, maybe you, it would be, you could choose what you want to do. And then with, it'd almost be more easier than normal school because some schools don't have options. Like um, the high school I'm going to has a lot of music, but some other schools I was looking at have little to no music where I am. So if it was all online, you know, uh, you have so much more resources and I'd like them to be uh, uh, open to everybody. So what I would like would be a sort of choice on what you want to learn. You have a guideline of what you want to learn. And then you can have, uh, I guess, and then you just pick a class. Uh, and then you get put in the class, you have a schedule, and then there you go. And, and, that, and that's what I would like. Like, my, my school, you can't really do that. It's very different. But I can imagine for a lot of other people, that would be the best. Oh, it's just a thought. I don't know. <laughs> As you're talking, question. I'm thinking about um, one of my sons who actually does the music for the show, Steve. And marching band ended up being a critically important part of his music education. Part of it was social, part of it was confidence, part of it was discovery of what was possible. And then everything opened up, right? So how do you do, I mean, yes, we can have lots of boxes on the screen, right? We can create a Hollywood squares squared, cubed. Uh, so we can have an entire marching band on the screen, but oh my. Um, so we've got to find ways of doing that. And I don't know what that app is um, or what that technology is or what that not technology is because people are playing in a park or something like that. There has to be a real world component here. And um, it's mystifying, but it's really important that we're talking about this and thinking about it because it doesn't happen unless we at least begin the discussions. And uh, I'm grateful to all of you for helping to to kind of pitch in on that thinking and for a very active chatting community on the side, I've been watching the screen for the first time because we're learning how to do this. So uh, some of the comments have been just crazy wonderful. Um, we have to think about whether school is modern governance. We have to think about how to move libraries into the next generation. Um, individual experiences of uh, just so many different things. The individual teacher who has made a world of difference to that individual student and that interaction might not happen online. So many different pieces and parts of this. So um, with that, uh, I made the promise to the audience long ago that we will finish up on time. That's what we're going to do. Um, so thank you all very much for all of the ideas and all that, and I hope we can continue the conversation. Uh, we'll see you all next week when we're addressing a very specific issue, and that is I work at school. There's a lot of people who work at schools around the world. What happens to my job in the middle of this? So we will see you next week. Thanks for joining us. demand episodes and more visit our website kids on earth contains hundreds of video interviews with students from around the world learning revolution is a global collaboration network for people who care about learning be sure to join us next thursday for a new episode of reinventing school
Thanks for watching.